My name is Jen and this is Jen Geigley Knits. I thought I would do just kind of a knitting hangout video today. <laughs> um, I am working on my Crowberry sweater from the MDK Field Guide Moss with Helene Magnuson's designs and I haven't got too much further. You can't really tell. I've been knitting a while on it but just sporadically, so I'm still getting a few rows in on the stockinette section. Um, but this week, I don't feel like I have a lot to share because this is really all I've been doing. It's just this. I finished my aperture sweater last week, and then this week has just been kind of busy, so I don't have a ton of exciting things to share. I don't have any acquisitions to share. <laughs> There's not a, a lot going on except family stuff, work stuff. I am hanging out here on the couch with Dinah, but she's just right over here where you cannot see her, but maybe she'll come a little closer. Can you come over here in a bit? <laughs> if she feels like it. Um, but I kind of thought I would just do a little storytelling session today, a very relaxed, casual, laid back, hang out with me and knit type of thing. Um, since I don't have a lot of new things to share. So uh, a lot of you know that April is Autism Awareness Month. And a lot of you also know if you, especially if you watched my Vlogmas this past year, that I have a son who has autism, he's 12. And his name is Bowie. And if you watched Vlogmas, he appeared a few times with me because he's a YouTube expert, as those that kids of that age are. Um, he likes to do the whole spiel, like the like and subscribe and the click the notification bells. And he likes to, um, he loves to make videos. He's really good at presenting information and speaking, like he has zero fear. And he knows a lot of interesting facts and likes to share that. So he's really good on camera, actually. <laughs> so he joined me a couple times over Vlogmas. If you want to look back, you can probably find our little episodes. But um, he's a ton of fun. And I do like to kind of share our family's experience and share a little bit about autism, like the real life part of it. Um, just during Autism Awareness Month, not just during the month, but I do like to share our stories and our experiences during this month because it does help people, I think, maybe understand us a little bit more. There's Dinah's ear. Can you see her? She's right here. Um, I think that's how you share awareness and acceptance um, of something different that not everyone encounters every day or... Um, but, it seems though that these days, everyone's lives are, are kind of touched by autism. You know somebody, you're related to somebody, it's your grandchild or your neighbor's son or, you know, something. There's some somewhere in your life that you know someone who has autism, I'm sure of it. So, and it's more and more common. It's more commonly diagnosed now. It's easily, you know, more, I don't know. There's a lot of accessibility stuff that exists now that didn't before. Um, new programs, new things at school, so many opportunities. And so I think it's more visible and out there than it ever has been. Um, I've been reading about things all the time that I didn't even know about. And I feel like I'm aware and I'm on top of the new autism things, but there's just so much more coming out all the time. But I do have a few stories. Um, I used to be back in the day, kind of a blogger, like a family life blogger, craft blogger, whatever you want to call it. I did a bunch of things. Um, and I'm kind of glad I did jump on that little bandwagon at the time because um, I'm by no means a writer, but it was almost like a journal or a diary entry of what was happening at the time. And I was pretty honest and open um, even back then with things that were going on as we were going through them, as I was experiencing them. And so, um, I wrote like three pretty solid little stories, um, of things that were going on with us of getting the diagnosis and that kind of stuff. And I'm so happy I wrote it down as it was happening at that time in that moment, because you really quickly forget how you felt, 
how your kids felt, how we all felt going through these things, um, the little details. It's really easy to lose that stuff, even though it feels like it was just yesterday in my mind. I can remember that these days, like, like they were just a minute ago, even though that was, you know, a little over 10 years ago now. I'm so happy I wrote them down and I might have to look and refer to them because I quickly forget all the little details and there's some really interesting little details about these days. But um, I've shared, if you follow me on Instagram, you're, you're seeing that I'm sharing a little bit about autism each day this month. I'm gonna not do it every day, but in the beginning I do share a few things. I, I like to share on World Autism Day, which is April 2nd and that was this week. And then, um, Today, April 4th, is a big day just for our family, um, and I'll just jump in with that story right off the bat because it's a good way to start things off. And if this is not your thing, I totally understand. You can skip this video. I am just really knitting and kind of chatting and telling stories for this episode. It's very different than my other ones, and so if you're not into it, I totally get it. But if you just want to hang out and listen to my weird stories, that's great, and I do love sharing a little bit about autism and our family life and all that stuff if you're interested. And so maybe you can, you know, apply it to your life or someone you love or whatever, or not, or just, you know, learn a little bit about someone whose home life is a little bit maybe different than yours. We have a unique little family. I'll just kind of go over our household dynamic. <laughs> We're very normal. We're very average. I feel like we like my, our normal is very like, I don't know, normal to me. <laughs> so it's me in this house, my husband, Bo, we've been married almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years this fall. Um, and then we have my daughter Lotus, who is 17. She's a junior in high school. She's amazing. And then my son, Bowie, who is 12 and he's in sixth grade. So um, that's our little family. My kids are so close, so tight. Like I've never really seen a, bond, a sibling bond like theirs. It's very, very special. And I'm kind of, I, I get a little, I almost take it for granted because they're very easy. They're really good friends. They play together all the time. They hang out like genuinely hang out and talk and do all these things together. And it's just amazing. They look out for each other in their own ways. Um, Lotus has been the, the best, best big sister the whole, all these years. And she's understood him in times when nobody really else could really understand him the way she does. Um, and so they have really interesting things. So that's kind of our family at a glance in case that you're new here or in case you're not familiar with us. <laughs> um, and so Bowie, when he was little, so I had Lotus first. She was neurotypical. Um, she, all, she does have ADHD and some neuro stuff. We all kind of have some neuro stuff, <laughs> but um, I kind of knew what it was like to have a typical child. I also was a nanny before I became a mom and I learned a lot about babies and toddlers and development just from, you know, taking care of kids. And then interestingly enough, um, shortly after college, I worked in an in-home residential place where like autistic people live. And I worked in a home that, um, where four boys lived and they were kind of like some older teens and early twenties a little um, group of them and most of them were pretty nonverbal and I worked there for quite a while. Um, for a while I kind of worked the overnight shift which was really interesting and then I would be there in the early mornings and so I'd help the youngest one get ready for high school and like we'd make breakfast together and do all these things and we had picture boards for each task where you'd move the picture over um, as you were doing it so you could see what was next on your schedule. It was really interesting. So I kind of knew about autism from that in my training there and just my experiences there. But, you know, a little bit of foreshadowing. I had no idea I would one day have a child with autism, <laughs> like no clue. But, um, and so like when Bowie was born, totally normal baby, um, sweetest kind of easy baby, honestly, he, you know, second child, 
kind of goes with the flow, blends into the family. Um, I felt like I wasn't really a rookie mom anymore. Like I kind of knew what I was doing and he was delightful. Um, but later on, we noticed that he had some developmental delays, but nothing, you know, nothing we were too worried about. Um, he had a definite speech delay where my, my daughter was like talking, talking, talking by one, by age one. He was not. But, um, you know, I was like, oh, he's a different kid. Kids are all different. He's a boy. I don't know. Like, maybe it's just different. And there are speech delays. That's like a real thing, too. Um, there were some other things. He um, maybe stimmed a little bit at that age, but more when he was a toddler. Um, he still does that. He will flap and flap his hands and jump a little bit pretty much when he's excited and happy. Some kids and adults stim when they're upset or when something is hard for them. And that's, he does that a little bit, but mostly it's like when he's joyous and happy and excited and having fun, he like can't contain himself. Um, so we sometimes saw that he would spin a little bit as he got like a little bit older and could walk. He walked on time and all that, the physical stuff was pretty right on. He did have some fine motor difficulties, but the speech thing was the real thing that stood out to me and his pediatrician. Um, and you fill out these worksheets when you go to their exams, like what's happening and what's not quite happening yet. And we just kind of waited, even his pediatrician, who's kind of a friend of ours and had been our doctor for years was like, I'm sure it's just a speech delay. I don't, I'm not too worried about it. He would sometimes have pretty good eye contact. It wasn't always really good, but he would really look at me and like his family members and but sometimes we would call his name and he wouldn't seem to hear us. Um, they always check hearing and all that stuff just to be sure. But yeah, there's some signs that like, I was like, huh, I wonder if it could be autism, but like, no, he didn't fit a lot of the criteria, but some of it he did. Um, but it can be tricky. These kids can be tricky and it doesn't, it's not like a textbook, this, 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 this all the time. So we were kind of confused and we were just kind of waiting to see. Um, and then when he got to be three, two and three, we, we were more worried about the speech stuff. So I talked to my pediatrician and then we got help from the Heartland AEA and they sent a free therapist to our home once a week who was a saint. I loved her so much. This woman came and basically would play with us on the floor. I would be involved as well. And I learned a lot from her too, like um, pretend play we worked on, taking turns, um, listening, interacting, verbal instructions, all these different things to see like how he processes things and to see if he would want to be involved with us in the play, um, trying to draw out some language. I was already doing baby sign with him. Um, some, some sign language to kind of communicate because it's so hard when a toddler can't tell you what's wrong or what they want. And so we worked on that a little bit too, because I knew we had to find a way to communicate. I knew how important that was. Um, and so I remember kind of asking her, do you think he has autism? I don't know if I could even say that at that point. I think it was, I was still in this mindset of like, it's probably not, I'm probably overreacting. My husband did not think it was that and kind of didn't even want to know, like, everything's going to be okay. We're okay. Um, I was like the late night scroller reading and reading and reading stuff. And some of it's not good to read and some of it's valuable information, but you have to weed out the good and the bad and, you know, try to figure it out. And you, everybody could take these online evaluations and stuff, but really we needed to see a doctor and have an evaluation. And I quickly found out teachers, and these therapists that we were working with um, aren't really allowed to tell you, yes, we think it's autism. They might see it every day and they probably know right away, yeah, this, this kid is autistic. And it's harder to see, I think, as a parent, you don't really know. It's so hard because you're so close to it. Even with my background working in an autistic home residential facility, I wasn't sure. <laughs> So yeah, my, I asked my Heartland AEA therapist who I adored and who I started to feel very close to, um, she's in your home with your child, you know, and she's helping us so much. And she's, the things she's doing are working even at that early age. They say intervention, the early intervention is so important and it absolutely is. We are like a poster child of this. 
Um, and I'm so grateful that these resources were available to us at age two, as soon as we noticed some things, they get on it. Autism or not, this helps children um, tap into what they can do and what their potential is. So it was a really important step. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is, <laughs> I asked her, could this be autism or do you think we should get evaluated? I sort of whispered it. I remember it was real like, Ugh, I don't know if I should even say this word. And I know she couldn't say yes, or like, I think it is, or, you know, she, I think she around about said, and she wasn't even like supposed to say this, like, um, maybe it's something you could check into, or, you know, it wouldn't hurt to check it out. I know she was like, on the line of what she was allowed to say to me. And then I knew like, oh, yep, okay. We better push a little harder for this because I know my pediatrician wasn't like, yes, do it. So I think we went back to him and I asked, you know, how do we get that? How do we get an evaluation? You have to get a referral from your pediatrician and he did put us through. And I know there was a waiting, there was a long waiting period. I'm sure I wrote this down somewhere. I don't remember if it was like 18 months, maybe it was less six or eight months. We had a luckier, I know some people have to wait way longer. Everybody has to wait. These doctors who do this, um, are seeing a lot of patients and there's maybe not enough of them. I think it's getting a little better but there's always a waiting period. And man, that is the hardest part. Like the Tom Petty song, the waiting is the hardest part. You can drive yourself crazy. I was really trying to like keep myself in check um, because you know, with the internet, it is tough. You can get sucked into some, you know, message boards and things that maybe you don't need to be reading. Um, and, you know, some misinformation that's out there. There's also a lot of good stuff. And I was just kind of preparing myself, I think, for this possibility that this might be autism. And so we, this is not even the story I was gonna tell. Is it? Yeah, it is, it's getting there. <laughs> I'm just gonna take you on our journey, okay? So finally we go and get the evaluation. Um, my husband's still pretty sure it's not autism. He's not worried about it. I decide to take Bowie, you know, Lotus is at school this day, it's like a weekday. And our, our evaluation is in the morning and I just take Bowie by myself to blank children's hospital. In hindsight, I really wish I had made my husband come with me, but it's okay. It all worked out the way it did. And I relayed all the information to him and it was, it was okay. But I don't know if I was ready for like the impact of this day. Not that it's not like a big, big deal, but it was a turning point. I think uh, more than I, thought it would be. So it's funny because today is the anniversary of that actual exact day. That's why I kind of felt like, wow, I don't know what to do for this week's video. I don't know what to talk about, but I guess I can talk about that because I've talked a bit about it on Instagram. And I think it is valuable information to share because there's a lot of people out there finding out this news as adults as teenagers, as kids, as moms, as grandparents, um, all every kind of relationship. Um, they're doing this. I, I met with a new friend yesterday for coffee and she just found out her four-year-old has autism. And I love meeting up with people like that and kind of sharing my experience too, as you know, someone who's a little bit further down that road to, to comfort them and be like, it's okay. And everything's gonna be okay. And you're gonna be okay. And your kid is gonna be okay. And your family's gonna be like, it's all gonna be all right. Because now I can say like with confidence, it's gonna be okay. And there's gonna be some hard times and some bumpy roads, but it is gonna be okay. So anyway, circle back. <laughs> um, I'm not the greatest storyteller, but I'm getting there. So on April 4th, and April obviously is autism month, autism, autism, autism. <laughs> April 4th, 2016, I took Bowie to Blank Children's Hospital for evaluation with this renowned doctor, like this doctor, it's like the autism guy at this time. This is 12 years ago too. Things have changed as you know, time has gone on, but he was the guy. 
and you had to wait to see the guy or you had to go to like Iowa City or, or a different place to get this evaluation that was like the real deal. So our guy is Dr. Noble, who is the coolest. He's like a dad. He's fun. He's kind of funny. He's cool. You know, like he made it a comfortable, good experience. I feel like he was wonderful. He really knows his stuff. And immediately we felt, I felt so good about this situation, which was really, really nice. Um, and it's a long, grueling process for a four-year-old who, you know, is on the spectrum. And they have them do all kinds of little tasks, little activities, um, colors, matching, different things to see what they can do, what they know. And Bowie was pretty nonverbal at this point or hard to understand. He also had his own set of made up vocabulary words that were like his language that were kind of babbly that we could kind of make out what he meant sometimes, but outside our family, you would not know, or you'd have to learn and get to know him to see what he was saying. Um, and so that was one thing too, like his communication, they really looked at his auditory processing, like instructions. Can he follow that? Or can he hear you say his name, you know, when you're, when you're not looking at, he's not looking at you. Um, it was like, it felt like hours. I do not remember how many hours it was. It was a long <laughs> evaluation with different parts, um, and different practitioners coming in and doing the different things and studying him and writing notes and doing all this stuff. And I'm just sitting there like, Oh gosh, is he doing okay? Is he doing like it wrong or like what? <laughs> You just sit there like, this is my kid and this is what he's doing. And I don't know. And um, so we went through it. It was long. It was hard. I think he had a hard time in some of it, but he did his thing and he showed them who he is. And um, it's just an interesting to, thing to go through, I think. And, you know, the whole time I'm just kind of in the corner, you know, sweaty palms and just kind of waiting and then um, Dr. Noble tells us, yes, it's, I think it's autism. Um, there are some little tricky things he does that makes it tricky to tell. He, he did mention that because I'm, it, I was like, you know, he's really good at this, but then this is super hard for him. You know, it's just, you're trying to figure it all out, but yep. And then, so we found that out and he's like, you know, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm going to tell my husband, or I think I said, how am I going to tell my husband? Of course, Bo is so understanding. It's not, this is nothing against him, but I, you know, it's just the immediate thing you think like, oh my gosh, this is real. It is autism and you just don't even know what to do yet. And then they give you all this information, like a huge binder and a packet and papers about signing up for like disability, um, for like Medicaid. I don't even, I don't even remember all of it for every kind of therapy you can get, occupational therapy, speech therapy, we needed food therapy. He was really, he had a hard time eating different foods of a different texture. Um, all these different things that were very new to me and now they're like second half, <laughs> easy stuff. Um, school information, early preschool. We were doing early preschool by age I think he did a two to three year old preschool, obviously the three to four regular preschool. We got him in there right away with peers, teachers. He cried and cried and cried. And it was so extremely hard to take him. And I just wanted to keep him home. I was like, he's too little. He's too, he's too small. He's not ready. But it did really help because they were helping me draw out his language skills and it was amazing to see how this progressed because there was a time, and my husband will come on here and say the same thing. We did not know if he would say mom or dad or low or lotus or sister or hi or any of the, he would sometimes make like a vowel sound or, you know, he, he wouldn't, he even had a hard time like pointing or anything like that. So it was, we were like, whoa. You know, this is tough, but it happened. And his vocabulary and his language skills came out slowly but surely. And he put, you know, two words together or, you know, something. He just surprised us with like a sentence eventually or, you know, and then 
um, the thing that ended up bringing his language out was, and don't judge me, because you're going to see why, <laughs> TV and movies that he was super interested in. And, you know, we're doing speech therapy and I'm reading and I'm doing all the language stuff and we are learning new ways to speak with him back and forth to pull out the answers we're looking for and stuff like that. We're doing all that, I promise you. But he had a special interest and in autistic kids, a special interest is a big deal and you don't ignore it. You tap into it and you help, you have that thing that helps you, um, like expand their learning and their, what they can do. So it was the Lego movie for Bowie, which came out whenever that time period was. Um, the Lego movie is Emmett, the little construction worker. He has a little orange and blue outfit. His, his voice is, is by Chris Pratt. And for some reason that was his special movie. And we would watch him watching this movie, you know, over and over because autistic kids, all kids, love repetition, but autistic kids really, really love repetition. <laughs> and he would play the same little clip again and again, like a 30 second little, or even a 10 second little segment of speech or a, a speaking part and, or this song or this little section of it. And he was memorizing this movie and he couldn't say the words yet. We would see him sort of mouthing the words in time. He knew the whole thing. These little kids are so smart. This stinker was like a little genius in there. And we're just like, come on, come on. So we learned the movie. We, this almost makes me cry. We learned that Lego movie because it was on all the time. And we figured out that by acting out the scenes with him, Lotus would do a part. I would do a line. We all had different parts and he'd do the next one and it would pull out his language skills and he would say it in perfect, like in the voice, in the tone, in the whole, you know, like everything. And he did it more and more and more. And he became obsessed with the Lego movie and we did too. And it was working and little things like that. That is how he really learned to speak. I'm gonna take a tiny break and I'm gonna go find one of his Emmets because this is a whole other part of the story. One moment. Okay, so this, I know, hi kitty. <laughs> this is Emmett and he is iconic in our family. He is like legendary. And at one point in time, we had probably 20 of this exact figure. It had to be this one. It had to be not the ones with the different facial expressions or a slightly different outfit. It had to be this one. And eventually he would, but we would carry these around. This is why we had to have so many. We had to have backups. They would get lost and it would be a crisis situation before we got multiples. Um, one of them went down to a storm drain outside and we couldn't get him back. And it was crying for a very long time until we found another one. Um, so we learned quickly that we needed a, a multiple like collection of special Emmets. Um, he would hold them in his hand and take them everywhere he went. This was his thing. He took this to preschool day after day. Sometimes he'd forget it at preschool and I would go and they would call me from the office and he would be sitting like this on top of the computer thing. And I would come and get Emmett because they knew we had to have him. Um, he went everywhere with us. He was a big part of our lives and we listened to him every day. We watched the Lego movie. I'm gonna have to read, there's a little excerpt from the movie that it's, it, Emmett in the movie is the hero, but he's like an ordinary guy, but he becomes the special. And there is this speech about the special and it's like so parallel to autism and like our journey with this whole stinking movie and what we were really going through in real life with my child that it still like gets me every time. It's actually a really beautiful movie. If you've never seen the Lego movie, it's actually really well done. It has Will Ferrell. It's a beautiful story. It's not just about Legos. It's like 
human spirit stuff and beautiful message. And let me go get the speech from the Lego movie because it's, it's good. I have to read it. Okay, I'm taking part of this from my blog post from what year? 2018 is when I wrote this. Um, but the one of the quotes, there's two quotes, I guess, um, from the movie. One day, a talented lasser fellow, a special one with a face of yellow, will make the piece of resistance found from its hiding refuge underground. And with a noble army at helm, this master builder will thwart the craggle and save the realm and be the greatest, most interesting, most important person of all time. And then Vitruvius says, all of this is true because it rhymes. So this long speech that I just read, it's like a little speech that they give during the movie. Bowie learned that from going to, from nonverbal, you know, and then hard to understand and babbling and even signing to learning and learning and learning and speaking little bit by little bit to like imperfectly memorizing things like this. Like he would say it in his own way, but we were like, damn it, that's that speech from Lego movie. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just reading through this old blog post because it's actually really sweet. I said he was practicing his language and we participated in the practice because it was working. The Lego movie gave him the confidence to speak. This movie was a big deal to him. It was funny, it was engaging, and we knew it was helping. During Bowie's toddler years, Bo and I honestly did not know if Bowie would ever learn how to talk. Um, if he was super into something that was going to help bring out his speech, we were ready to dive in head first. And then it says, yeah, and Bowie didn't let go of Emmett for the next two years. This is true. And he's still, we, we, ha we still have these all around the house. Like he remembers this time in his life and so do we. Um, and I have all these pictures of all of our Emmets. I'll just put them on like, obviously this is just on my laptop, but I'll share them here too because it's actually, it's pretty cool. His collection. Um, about the replacement Emmets, the three-year-old preschool. See, this is the detail stuff that I'm glad I wrote down because I do forget the timing of all this. So this is like when he was three and four and then our diagnosis. Okay, Emmett really was the special for Bowie and for our family. Emmett was there for us during that important, sometimes rocky new autism phase, and he was there for Bowie too. Emmett taught us some really good things. Quite frankly, he left us all with some fantastically inspirational messages that will remain ingrained into our brains and lives forever. Bowie recently started watching the Lego movie again, and to no one's surprise, he still knows all of the words like these. This is the speech and I'm gonna like, it makes me sad, like happy, sad. Okay. At the end, Emmett like saves the world and says, you are the most talented, most interesting, and most extraordinary person in the universe. And you are capable of amazing things because you are the special. And so am I. And so is everyone. The prophecy is made up, but it's also true. It's about all of us. Right now, it's about you, and you can still change everything. So, yeah, he memorized that part, too. And, like, every time we'd watch this movie, it'd just be like, <gasps> this might not make sense to anyone else. <laughs> I don't know if this story, like, even resonates, but um, I, I don't think it ever hurts to share, and so I'm sharing it. So another piece of this story goes back to that day, which is today in history, <laughs> April 4th, 2016. So we get his diagnosis. We come home. I tell my husband, um, Lotus was still pretty young, but I think we told her too. We just, um, but we're just our normal selves. We go home. I did take my son out for ice cream right after the appointment because I didn't know what to do. And we'd, I feel like we'd both been through it. He had been through this long evaluation that he had to do all these tasks. He didn't want to do it. He was like, ugh, fed up, want to go home. We're done with this. So I did take him out to have orange leaf, like the frozen yogurt with the flavors and stuff. So I felt like we both needed ice cream and a treat. And so we did that. And I seriously, beyond that, did not know what to do. But in hindsight, that was probably the perfect thing to do. And I feel like we should maybe get ice cream today to like celebrate that day. 
too. I don't know. But okay, the 4 4 16 thing. So we go home that day, and then that evening we go to Target, like any other day, like very ordinary. Um, when we get there, um, at that time, Bowie collected the little plastic animal toys. Like there's a bin of little plastic animals, you know what I'm talking about, like farm animals, regular animals, jungle animals, bears, lions, whatever. So he collected these and that would sometimes be like his little treat or a special, you know, thing. So we let him pick out an animal that day. And at that time in his life, he hated anything with a tag, a stuffed animal with a tag, a shirt with a tag, any kind of tag, it had to go. Like he hated tags, it really irritated him. So we get up to the cashier and he's like, kind of pulling on this tag and he's like, cut it, cut it. You know, he could, he could say, I think he could say words at that point, but it wasn't always, this was a good, like he was persistent about this. So this cashier, young guy, super tall. I, this is how I remember it. He leans over right away and he's like, oh, that tag is really bugging him, isn't it? And I said, yeah. And he's like, uh, he just cuts it off, you know, scans it, but then, you know, trims it off. And Bowie's like so relieved that his animal doesn't have this tag anymore. And then as we're sliding our things onto the cash, the, you know, the checkout thing, um, the cashier starts commenting on every single thing I'm putting on there. Like, oh, well, that's da 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 and that's you know, why, you know, uh, just having comments on everything I was putting on the conveyor belt. And then he's like, I don't know, I thanked him for cutting the tag. And he said, you know, this is a special day. And it like kind of took my breath away. And I'm like, this is a special day, but he doesn't know why it's our special day. It's like been a weird day and it hadn't all sunk in yet. But yeah, it was a special day. And so the cashier just said this out of the blue, like, this is a special day. And I was like, huh, yeah, like, it is a special day. And he's like, well, it's square root day. And I'm like, oh, is it? And he's like, it's 4 4 16. It's April 4th, 2016, blah, blah, blah. It's, um, you know, four and four. And it's, it's like a perfect square. It's four and four, the square root of 16, all this stuff. He goes into the math for a long time and keeps talking about it. And I'm like, huh, this guy is totally on the spectrum. And he was so cool and so fascinating and telling us all this stuff and we're just chatting it up. And I'm like, yeah, it is a special day. This is square, he's like, it's square root day. And um, I wrote about this on Instagram. I wrote it way better than what I'm saying right now, but it just hit me like this guy, this sweet cashier guy who had just helped fix our tag problem and then just explained square roots to me and like how this day was special and the numbers and all of it. He was also giving me a preview of, you know, 20 somethings on the spectrum and how it's all going to be okay. And he's like living his life, doing his job, doing his thing. And I'm realizing like my kid someday is going to be the same way, doing his thing, doing something as a, you know, older, you know, not kid anymore. And it's all going to be okay. So this sweet cashier, and I wrote Target later on to thank and, and to like say that he was doing a good job to get good feedback about this cashier. I don't know how often people do that, but he really made the difference in our day. And I kind of explained why. And I said, I don't know if he's on the spectrum or not, but this hit us on a, on a very significant day where, that, I don't know, he was just, he made a big impact on me. Anyway, a very fragmented story, I know, but that cashier that day was a blessing to us and something I needed to see and like a slow realization of like, everything's fine. Um, autistic parents always worry about the future. It's always in the back of our mind. You can't help but think about it. Are they, are this, is this kid gonna move out of my house? Are they gonna be with us forever? Are they, are they gonna have a job? Are they going to like, all these different little milestones along the way. What is it going to be like? What are they gonna be like in high school? All these things, you just think about it. It's just natural. 
and you never know. And now as I'm getting a little bit further on my journey with my kid, even with my, with, with Lotus, the neurotypical child who's not on the spectrum, but still has, you know, some stuff, you never know. You can't plan this. You can't predict it. You might as well just not even worry about it, but you, I mean, you do. So um, I never could have predicted what Bowie would do in sixth grade where he is now. Um, when he was little and non-speaking, I never knew he'd like be reading full chapter books now and multiplying and dividing and like getting these little reading awards from his teachers and stuff at school. It's like, you never know. And I don't know what he will do in 12th grade and beyond, or, you know, I, I have no idea what is his future going to be like. That is part of the fun and the journey is they surprise you every step of the way, every single day. It's just a journey and you're on it together and I am ready. I am prepared. I read, I try everything that I can do to help my kids succeed and to do the best we all can. And so yeah, today is square root day. If you didn't know, not, it doesn't work out perfectly because it's not 2016, but that day it's still four, four. So it's still like our day, <laughs> but it's a special day. That's the story. Um, and yeah, that's some of our autism stories. I would like to say thank you to that cashier, wherever you are, whoever you are. I wish I knew your name and I don't, I don't see this person at the store anymore. And this is, it is a, a long time ago. So maybe he's moved on and is doing other things now. But um, that was a pivotal day in our life. And he, you made it better and gave us this square root day, which is very special to us now and this whole story and this experience. And this is another one that might not make sense or resonate with anyone else but us, but, but um, just seeing, and now I am, um, I've befriended some people in our community, like 20 something early adulthood people with autism in our city who are doing big, great things. Um, my friend, Tyler Leach, I'm gonna put the link below. He has started something called the Barefoot Autism Challenge because he does not like wearing socks and shoes. He likes to experience the world with his senses and he challenges us all to experience the world barefoot. So go outside and go for a walk barefoot. Go walk down your driveway. Go walk in the grass, um, even around your home. And he will ask you to like take a picture of your bare feet, experiencing your senses in the world um, barefoot. So that is also during the month of April. And I think, um, he contacted me for help finding a way to do a video at the Des Moines art center where I teach classes. And so he's an awesome individual. And he also helped change the Iowa law. And this is a big deal, um, for driver's licenses. So he was pulled over for something and did not have the greatest experience with the police. Um, Tyler drives and he's autistic and it, just wasn't like they weren't understanding him and it just wasn't a positive experience. And so he helped get the law changed in Iowa that there's now a driver's license, um, like stamp or cert like not certification, like a, a thing on your driver's license that says I'm autistic and law enforcement is supposed to look at that and be aware of like, okay, I should deal with this person a little bit differently with some more understanding um, because they're on the spectrum. So that's a huge thing that my autistic friend, Tyler, who's amazing and involved in our community and in, on all these boards, he speaks, he's on TV, like every, he's, he's amazing, but he has made real change in our community. He's involved in special Olympics. He does, he does it all. Um, so I don't know. It's just really exciting to see these kids that grow up into, you know, adults and then what they do next. So never underestimate. Okay. I will tell one more story and then my content will be autism free until maybe next year <laughs> or the next time that Bowie wants to like guest host, like he did that one time. He does like being on camera and like doing videos. So maybe, maybe he'll pop in sometime. But the other story that I like to share is um, in 2019, I met Temple Grandin, who is a legendary 
award-winning scientist, extremely smart person who has written all of these books about autism. She's like an advocate and she's also an animal rights advocate. She's done a lot for animal rights, for the farming community, for like the treatment of livestock and all that stuff too. It's, she's fascinating. If you do not know about Temple Grandin, look her up right now. I'm going to put some links below because there's a really good movie about her that stars Claire Danes. I think it, I watched it on like HBO Max or whatever a long time ago, but you should totally see it. It's really, really well done. Some autism movies hit me the wrong way or it like makes me sad, but this one's really, really good. And you just have to learn about Temple Grandin in some way. If you don't want to watch the movie, go look up on YouTube or link below um, her TED Talks. She has all kinds of videos online. She is fascinating. She's very different. She is probably in her 70s now. She might be 80. I'm not even sure. But she, this is, this is what makes her special. Temple Grandin is autistic. And she is from a generation where I'm sure very few people were diagnosed or that this was spotted because it wasn't well known back then. Um, she had a very special mother who really helped her and almost did in-home therapy herself on her own, figuring it out as they went, pushed her, you know, gentle pushes and like helped her learn and try new things and kind of um, made her expand her horizons, you know, but went from nonverbal to like extraordinarily intelligent and talented and doing all these prolific, amazing things that were, you know, changing industries and pushing through male dominated um, businesses, you know, just all these ama these obstacles that she overcame and learned about animals and found a connection with animals that is just fascinating. And she's written tons of amazing books. So my very, very favorite books about autism are all by Temple Grandin because it's coming straight from the source. Um, she was one of the first people who had autism who explained it first person from her viewpoint and from what she had learned and from what from all of her experiences. And this is just so rare, especially from someone, um, you know, generations ago that there was, you know, less understood about it, less medical knowledge about it. Um, I think in the movie they were saying that they were maybe suggesting she go to like a special kind of home or something and her mom refused and said, no, I, I'll, I'll do this myself. <laughs> and um, oh, I just learned so much from Temple Grandin. So my favorite books by her are The Autistic Brain and Visual Thinking, but they're all fantastic. Go to your library and go find the Temple Grandin books and read one this month for Autism Awareness Month because... Um, the more you know, and it's also about animals. It's about all kinds of things. So it's not just autism stuff. You're going to learn something about yourself or about your loved ones or your life, or, you know, you're going to have a different outlook on things after reading one of her books. I promise you. But yes, in 2019, I got to meet the legendary Temple Grandin by accident, kind of, um, which was a life-changing moment again for me. Um, so this was, you know, a few years after Bowie was diagnosed, he was still pretty little and I went to Iowa state university. That's where, actually where I went to college. And I, I saw that she was going to do a speaking engagement there. Um, and I really, really knew that I wanted to take this opportunity to see her speak in, in person. I had read books. Um, but I, I know she, she's just full of information and knowledge and stories and help for parents like me and for um, farmers and people that are working with animals, all kinds of people. So there's all kinds of people there. Iowa State has like a lot of agriculture and veterinarian school stuff too. So it's, it's just a really good animal thing too. But she was also talking about autism. And so I got there early because I had to drive. It's like half hour away from Des Moines. It's north of here. And so I got there real early because I, did, I didn't want to be late and I wanted to find a parking spot and whatever. So I got there early and I walked in and gave them my ticket and stuff. And then I saw she had a ton, like all of her books were out on the display thing. And so I was like, yes, because I really wanted to get some books. And so I started looking through all the books and then here she comes walking up to me. 
And if you've ever heard her voice, I can't do an impression. She has a very distinctive voice and kind of accent. Um, and she's she wears like cowboy attire. Like this is her thing. It's her look. It's her vibe. You've got to see the movie because it's it really shows it well. Like a cowboy, old school cowboy shirt with like some embellishments and stuff. Or maybe a bolo, you know, the, the whole thing. She's there. She walks up like in her way and and kind of asks me like, hi, why are you here? Like real direct. <laughs> what are you doing here? Something. I don't know. And I was like, <gasps> and I kind of, I was, I didn't even, I was like, what? It just was shocking and I wasn't ready. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I said, my son has autism. And she's like, well, and she wasted no time. She just started asking questions about him. Does he like art? Does he like animals? Does he like math? Like what kind of brain is like all, what is his learning style? And just rapid fire questions. I'm like, he loves art. He draws things all day long. He's, you know, struggling with his language a little bit, but he's getting there. And she talks to me about, you know, keep doing art with him. It's so important. He can do great things with art. Um, she asks if he draws the same thing over and over again. He does. He draws turtles. Ever since he was teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny, tiny, he's drawn variations of turtles, all kinds of turtles, but always turtles <laughs> and other things too, but mostly turtles. He'll go back to turtles every time. He knows every part, every name, and all the things about turtles and tortoises. And she's like, yep, for me, it was horses. And she always drew horses. And she's like, push him to draw other things. He needs to, to like expand and broaden his horizons, just even with what he draws and what he's interested in finding the details about, and especially with animals and stuff. So she goes into all that. And then she talks to me about visual learning, which she has a whole book about. It's one of her latest, most recent books called Visual Learning. Highly recommend. I'll link it below. Um, how their brains work in pictures. They see things like I know Bowie sees things in 3D. He understands like the back of something and all the way around. And inside, he understands what the back of a building will look like, like we're walking in a city. Um, and she said they see things like in Google Images. So if you think of a flower, they pull up like the images of all the flowers they remember seeing like in their life. It comes up like that and Bowie thinks that way and he explains things that way and he draws things this way. Um, he's really big into doing animations right now which is so fascinating. He wants to do video game design and I can just see him really being able to do this stuff like for real and now there's so many opportunities and college programs and things that will make this a reality I think. Um, so much more than ever before that I'm just now learning about too. But yeah Temple sat down and like gave me pretty much personalized advice for my child. She said, when he gets to high school, you have to tell them that he's not taking algebra. That Temple Grandin said, algebra is a waste of time for minds like his, that he should do geometry instead, that it's much more worth worthwhile and that he will like it more. And I was like, wow, can you write that down on a piece of paper? Like I have an excuse from Algebra for Bowie <laughs> from Dr. Temple Grandin. I, was, I didn't say that, but I was like, oh my goodness. She told me so many things. Um, so, you know, she's telling, talking, talk. we talked. It was a good, I don't even know how many minutes. It was a blur. It was surreal. And I was like, this is amazing. And I had tears in my eyes. It was so beautiful. She was so kind to share this stuff with me, I couldn't believe it. I'm just standing there, you know, like a stranger and boom, all of a sudden we're talking about really meaningful stuff that I can use for my child. It was just too much. So we finished up our talk. She told me all of her things. She had a whole list of things she told me. I'll tell you in a minute what I did because I wrote it all down right away. Um, so I went and got the two books that I had wanted to purchase. She signed them for me. I got one for the kids because there's a children's book called the girl who thought in pictures, I'll put it up here, the picture. Um, the girl who thought in pictures is like the children's book. And then I bought a book for myself, The Autistic Brain, and I had her sign them. And so I got her autograph. I got personalized advice. I said goodbye and I thanked her for her kindness and for her, like, I couldn't believe it. 
I just, I still can't believe it. It was such a memorable, special moment. I'll never forget it. She's incredible. She's one of a kind for sure. So then um, I like said goodbye and thank you and took my books. And then I went in a corner and I had a notebook in my bag and I wrote down every single thing right away that she told me because I knew like how quickly we forget. And I knew how special that was to get like this kind of person, just the few little things she knew about my child. She kind of knew what route to send me on next and what to do with him. And, you know, the challenge, she said, give him gentle pushes his whole life. Don't let him get too comfortable and just keep him inside your house. Push him to do new activities and try new things and join clubs that he's interested in his special interest. She's like, have him join all those clubs, try stuff, even if you don't think it's going to work out. And I have used that advice ever since. Sometimes I hear her voice saying, you know, gentle pushes, have him try new things. And I really um, try to take that advice and live by it. So definitely life-changing stuff. If you're new to Temple Grandin, this is probably the first book I would recommend. Even if you don't have someone with autism in your life, it's really interesting to read about how the brain works and how other people's brains work, or maybe someone you know their brains work like this. So it's called Visual Thinking by Temple Grandin. It's a New York Times bestseller. It's the hidden gifts of people who think in pictures, patterns, and abstractions. Um, a vivid recognition of the full breadth of the human ingenuity. And it says it's an absolute eye opener that reveals, celebrates, and advocates for the special minds and contributions of visual thinkers. So definitely, if you're looking for a new read, this is a great one to check out. I think that's all Dinah and I have for story time today. Thank you if you stuck around this long. Thank you for listening. Thank you for hanging out. Thank you for understanding and keeping an open mind. I think that's what Autism Acceptance Month is all about, is just sharing our stories and our experiences with each other and helping people know that they're not alone. You're not on an island. You're not in this by yourself. There's a lot of us who can understand and relate to what you're going through or what you're finding out about your child or yourself or your teenager or whoever in your life. Um, definitely share your experiences and stories below if you have someone in your life with autism or yourself or any anything like that. It's, um, it's really good to talk to others who can understand. And I know there's a lot of us out there. So thank you. Seriously, thank you for hanging out and, and being here and being, you know, kind of part of our little family sharing situation here. <laughs> it's knitting too. Next week, it'll be knitting. I promise. But this is, you know, a part of my life and something I'm passionate about sharing. And so thank you for hanging out and listening. Um, I'm hoping to have more done on my crowberry next time. So please stop back next Saturday. I'm uploading a new video every Saturday morning. So I'm hoping to be at the color work by next week. So stop back and see what's going on then. Um, but thank you for hanging out here and listening to my random stories that I don't know if they made any sense or not, but seriously, thanks. Thanks for letting me share. Um, I hope you have a good weekend and a good week ahead, and I will see you in the next one. Hey guys, it's Bowie, and I'm, I like doing reading, doing animations, building robots for me as an invention scientist. And, and doing anything I like and taking care of my cat and taking care of my tortoise. I hope you like and subscribe and turn on notifications and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!